Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John and thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. The original plan for today was to make a film about the M54. However, on looking, it turns out that there isn't really a lot to talk about on that particular motorway. So with the M54 not looking so interesting then, I needed to come up with some sort of alternative and I realised that the answer was staring me right in the face. If we have a look at M54 and fiddle some of the numbers around a little bit, we get the M45. So I started to look into this seemingly uninteresting motorway and at first glance I thought, no, there's no story here and there's no way I can span this out over several minutes. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. First things first, we're going to agree to fuck off the M54 and come back to it another day, instead focusing our attention on the M45. <laughs> You won't find hidden junctions or proposed service stations or any of the usual sort of things we've come to expect. However, what you will find is a motorway that offers a driving experience like no other. Driving on the M45 is much like travelling back in time to the early days of motorways in the 1960s. We'll come back to that point in a short while, but first let's look at why the M45 exists. If you take a look at the M45 on Google Maps, you'll notice it's rather short. And it is. It's 7.9 miles long and at this point you might be asking, why did they bother building it in the first place? The reason is because M1. When the M1 opened in 1959, it ran from Junction 5 at Watford up to Junction 18 at Crick. Now, it's not a sensible idea for a motorway to just come to an end at a roundabout or similar because you'd end up with a massive bottleneck of traffic. So the solution was to build motorway spur roads that would dissipate the traffic before the motorway terminated. And the M45 is indeed one of those spur roads. For a while, this would have been your main route into and out of Birmingham. But in 1972, the M6 came along slightly to the north and offered a much faster route and it very quickly became the preferred option for motorists. As a result, the M45 saw the number of users drop significantly and when the M40 came along, the numbers dropped even further. The M45 is now considered to have one of the lowest traffic volumes of any motorway on our network. There's another Jeff Marshall idea that we can steal, I mean take inspiration from, the least used motorways. Cheers Jeff. Cheers Jeff. So why then is the M45 a time capsule buried in the 1960s, offering a motorway experience like no other? Well, there's a few reasons for that. The first being the traffic volumes that we touched on earlier. There are so few cars on the M45, and when the motorways first opened, it was a similar story. Of course, these days, you'd be lucky to avoid traffic on any of our motorways, but with the M45, it's a whole different kettle of tarmac. Next up is the motorway architecture, the vast majority of which hasn't actually changed since its construction in the 1950s. In fact, in fact, with the exception of the central barrier and a junction added in 1991, it's pretty much original as it was. Take a look at some of the bridges and what might first appear to be some pretty horrible concrete structures are actually quite thoughtfully designed and you know what, I don't think they look too bad. It's quite apparent that during the design phase somebody put a little bit of effort in and really cared about the project. That somebody was architect and engineer Owen Williams. This guy has pretty much come up with all of the interesting buildings built between 1913 and the late 1950s, including Wembley Stadium, the original Twin Towers design, a whole host of viaducts, bridges, and of course, the Port Talbot Bypass. I'd recommend reading up on this guy because it seems he's had quite a career. The concrete bridges that he and his team have created have stood the test of time. Many, though, have been removed, replaced, modified or upgraded as a result of motorway widening works. This is not the case on the M45, and you'll find many examples of Williams bridges still in place as they were all those years ago. I won't go into too much detail on the bridge themselves, but Williams' idea was to have a standardised design that he could use in all situations. At face value, they all look the same, but look closer and you'll see that they all have a variety of width, length, thickness, skew and span. A design feature that you may not have noticed is the banding along the edge of the bridge. This banding varied according to what type of bridge was installed. You'd see two bands on short single carriageway under bridges and up to five on larger skewed two span over bridges. The inspiration for this came from Williams' earlier work with architects Maxwell Ayrton. Together, they looked to bring formal design composition to mass concrete structures. To be fair, I think they pulled it off and these sort of bridges are perhaps considered icons of our motorway network. 
I don't even know how far into the episode we are at this stage. We've not even got onto the M45, so we should probably crack on, really. So today's plan is to head west on the M45, but don't worry, it's only about 7.9 miles long, so it won't take long. We're going to start with the M45 and M1 interchange, which is actually the oldest motorway to motorway interchange in the country. It also features this lovely concrete curved underpass sort of bridge arrangement, courtesy of our friend Owen. I get the feeling that today's episode might contain quite a few maps and arrows and such like, because there aren't any motorway junctions for reference. A short distance up from the M1 interchange, and the M45 crosses over the Killsby Rail Tunnel, where you might spot this rather large brick structure in a field. It is, of course, one of the ventilation towers for the rail tunnel that runs right underneath us. I say one of because there are actually two of these rather impressive structures. The other sits just near the A5 a short distance from here. The tunnel is named after the nearby village of Killsby and is part of the West Coast Main Line. When it opened in 1838, it was the longest rail tunnel ever constructed. It also opened behind schedule and three times over budget, so I guess some things never change, eh? The tunnel shafts themselves were larger than you'd expect by modern standards. And this was simply because, at the time, they didn't know how much or how little ventilation would be needed, so they adopted the bigger is better approach. The two brick towers were given Grade 2 listed status in 1987 and are possibly some of the largest in the country. Sticking with the railway theme, which is a little bit odd considering we're a motoring channel, but there we are, there's a rather lovely abandoned or disused railway bridge that crosses the M45. It used to be part of the Great Central Railway, and when the M45 came along, the line was still running steam-hauled express services from London to Manchester. The bridge was opened along with the M45 in 1959. However, a short while later, the railway closed for business in 1966, meaning this bridge only served its purpose for seven years. It's been sat abandoned for over 55 years now. A short distance along, and you'll find the only junction on the M45, which was added in 1991. Prior to installation, the A45 that you see behind me would have gone right through the centre of Dunchurch before meeting up with the M45 at the Thurliston interchange. This caused a few problems for the folk of Dunchurch and it was decided that a bypass was needed and with the M45 running parallel it made a lot of sense to simply install a couple of slip roads that allowed traffic to avoid Dunchurch altogether. And interestingly this junction provides a great example of the only sort of modern thing to be installed on the M45 since its opening. Our journey's end sees us at the Thurliston interchange. The start or end of the M45. What's interesting is that here you'll find a small parking area that's technically an abandoned road. You can see on this 1960s map how the road layout used to be. Right next door to us is a reservoir called Draycott Water. However, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed it doesn't feature on our 1960s map. The reservoir wasn't completed until 1970 and it was built to meet the increasing water demands of the nearby Coventry and Rugby. It's a nice way to spend the afternoon and also provide some lovely backdrops for end of video sequences. With that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked the film. If you did, there's a button specifically for that. And if you wouldn't mind helping me out with that all-important subscribe button, it'd be much appreciated. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John, you've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Till then, take care, see ya, bye-bye. <laughs>